Welcome to the Equestrian Perspective Podcast. I'm Felicity Davies and I'm here to simplify horse training and teach you absolutely everything you need to know about how to build both your own and your horse's confidence levels, form an amazing relationship together and feel empowered in any environment. And on this podcast, I'll be sharing my best advice, trainings and mindset shifts so you can truly connect with your horse and pursue your goals in a way that feels good for both of you. So get ready to embark on a new equestrian perspective and I'll see you on the other side. Welcome to the Equestrian Perspective podcast and today I have with me Sarah Hans. How do you even say your last name? Hanscom. There we go. Hanscom. Sarah Hanscom. Yeah. <laughs> and Sarah used to be a two-star eventer and then transitioned into the dressage realm. And she is one of my Confident Equestrian Program students. And I really wanted to have her on the podcast to really just explain the value of learning how to um, really understand your horses on a sort of learning theory level, um, really refining your communication and desensitizing them to different forms of pressure and how that can really help you elevate your performance at competitions and also get the most out of your training sessions at home. So welcome, Sarah, to the podcast. Thank you for being here. Thanks for having me. Cool. So I'd like to start, if you can, just give us an overview of like, when did you start riding and your sort of journey through to, through to the point where you joined the program? Yeah, sure. So I started riding um, when I was nine. My mum and dad gave my twin sister and I 10, like a voucher for 10 lessons for our ninth birthday. And that was really silly because we lived in town, like dad worked in the city. Um, and now we live on property. Everybody at one point had their truck license. You know, we're on 20 acres. And I think at one point when Court was still riding, we had eight horses in work. So it got pretty full on pretty quickly. Um, my parents weren't horsey at all. Um, so bless them. They always made sure that we had instruction. Um, and I've been so lucky. I've had some absolutely brilliant instructors sort of in my riding career and those who have been with me really long term um which is really really nice uh yeah so we started riding we went to the pony club did all the state stuff did the national stuff um was always drawn to eventing I think it was the adrenaline um yeah and I was very very fortunate my first two sort of baby horses that I got when I was 16 I got a well Courtney my twin got an off the tracker that she um stopped riding so I took him on and then I got my first three horses two then um a big Irish sport horse to break in as my first sort of breaking in project. And both those guys took me um, four-star eventing. They got me on the national squad. Um, Yeah, I was really, really lucky. There were, I, you know, I honestly bought Quinn the Irish horse because he looked quiet to break in and he was. Um, When he was about six, he he really hit his straps and, yeah, was just probably the most talented horse I've ever sat on. And I wish I had him now because if I had him now, he probably would you know get on more teams and and things like that but um he's happily retired now which is nice he's babysitting the young horses Mm -hmm. and yeah in the last couple of years um my life got pretty busy I travel a bit with my husband for his work and just keeping them eventing was too hard um and also as anybody knows it's a huge financial pressure so to do sort of your four shows plus your big Melbourne Adelaide Sydney you're looking at spending so much money on competition fees. So if I wasn't there doing the gallop work, it just wasn't really worth doing. Um, And my young horses that I've had, I've always just bought them as yearlings or two-year-olds and sort of done all the work themselves, myself. Um, Didn't really want to jump like the other guys did. So it wasn't as inspiring being out on them cross country. So I decided to make the change over to dressage, um, which has been really fun. And it's definitely where I'll go now um, unless I have an absolute freak jumper again Mm. Um, but yeah that sort of gotten me up to where I started to look at um, CEP so I'm a physio so I work part-time and then I coach the rest of the time and one of my clients Nikki was actually doing Felicity's program and she was talking to me about it and I was like oh this sounds pretty good Um, and I was overseas in England and I had to come home and do hotel quarantine and that was actually when I called you Felicity to Mm. fill in an hour of my 14-day hotel quarantine, which was great, Hmm. um, and joined up. So got the course there, started, I did the first module, yeah, in quarantine while I was on the bike, 
um, and then we started in September. Yeah, I think it was. Yeah, so we went September to December, which was really good timing. I got home in July. The horses had had four months off, so it was really nice to just implement the groundwork stuff from the start. Um, obviously, I was just getting them fit and strong again, mm. um, and just start playing with it sort of from the get go. Yeah. Yeah, cool. And I think it's really, really cool that, like, firstly, you're a coach yourself and you not recognize that one of your students was doing this course and you're intrigued by it. And obviously, like, had you, I'm pretty sure you'd seen changes in her horse because you were doing some, like, virtual lessons, weren't you? Yeah, we were, absolutely. Um, so, yeah, when I was home, we were doing in-person stuff. Now I was in England for four months, so we were still doing twice a week online and we could definitely see a huge difference in season um that was the that was Nikki's horse um which was really really great to see and it was just really interesting sort of the things that Nikki was saying back to me were already values that I really held quite close to my heart so it was really the same language that yeah I already wanted to use um and yeah so it just it just felt really really natural I should also say the reason that I was looking into the course as well was um, we'd been trying to start a family and I wanted to upskill so that I could do some more things with horses on the ground that wasn't just riding, you know, a lot of sort of my riding career that had absolutely been the focus. So I had a really young mare who, you know, to get from the paddock up to the stable, I had to neck twitch her and that was fine because that's just what I'd always had to do. Um, Mm. She just leapt around and carried on a bit. Um, but I was like, I can't do this forever and it's not going to be safe and I need to work something out now um, to sort of set up all these little things. Another one was really tricky to load. Um, another one didn't really like anybody else except for me. So I was like, okay, they're all a little bit. Yeah. We all have things that they really need to work on to make this easier for when I can't be doing it all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I remember you said like when you first booked a call with me, you were just like, you tend to end up with the quirky characters and you want to help them be as confident as possible. And also, yeah, so that you can work with them as you're transitioning more to doing some stuff on the ground when you have to, um, but also preparing them for their future homes if you did have to rehome some of them. So I think, yeah, it's a really, really cool way of like, I guess, acknowledging that process because like you, like you said, there's so many things that you could do with the horses and you're very skilled. Like you got to a four-star eventing, you were competing like um, at, what were you competing, Maddie, at like medium level dressage or was it higher than that? Yeah. No, no, no. Medium. Yeah. 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 We did so it's medium. like you four-star eventer, medium level dressage, years of experience with horses, riding lots of quirky horses and being able to get everything done per se but now it's just the point of going oh okay like other people can't do what I've been doing and I know when like you know when you're in a position where you want to be a bit safer you don't want to do those things so you need some more answers yeah exactly yeah exactly yeah so I think it was super cool that yeah firstly like I said before you're a coach and you recognize the progress that your student was making and then you're like oh perfect I will join the course that my student's taking which is amazing um and then yeah I just really enjoyed your sort of the angle that you were coming at it from in regards to like we were just saying preparing the horses for their future homes and preparing you to work with them in a safer way um and also just really fine-tuning all those things like you said getting your um boy more comfortable with the float um like connecting on a deeper level with your mare and just all of these other components because you had lots of different horses to work with. So that's where you're at when you join the program. Now, um, you mentioned that you did some of the, the first module like a few months before we started because you joined early and anyone who joins the program early gets early access to module one, which is all about understanding how horses learn. How did you find just like watching that module and just like reflecting on those lessons in there? Yeah, look, the relationship bank account was huge um, because, yeah, it was just a huge sort of aha moment of like, absolutely, what? Like I had already had that in my sort of mentality, but really making sure that the horses actually wanted to spend time with me. Um, But the great thing about the module is that it gave you skills to actually do that in terms of teaching them food manners like my god they all just went crazy over food manners so you know I (laughs) didn't have that like all I had was either give them the day off and leave them alone 
or go in and just feed them with carrots. Um, so it wasn't really, yeah, and and some of them absolutely adored me, but, you know, some of them still were just like, oh, I prefer to not come to you yeah. um, in case you're going to, you know, in case we're going to work and that's all we ever do. Yeah. Um, so that was that was a really, really good one and that was great, again, especially because the horses were just coming back into work. Um, so mm. I was just long laning them. I had the, I really had the time to focus on that. Mm. Um yeah, just making them really, really happy and wanting to come to work. All of them, well, except for the young Billy, would stop the whole way up to the arena. I think that was one of my goals and I think we got it done in like the first month, which was great. Um, and that doesn't happen at all anymore. Like they never yeah. stop. Yeah. Um, and it's not like they did anything naughty. They were just like, oh, stop. Yeah, do really we have to do it? Yeah. yeah, exactly. And then you're like, come on. They're like, oh, okay. Whereas now they're just like, yep, cool, off we go. Yeah, um, and then the other big thing I think in terms of that was also really respecting them saying no. Mm. I think it's very drilled into coming from sort of English competition riding that you know the horse has to do what you say mm. because that's how it makes it safe, um, which is not true. At you know, like they are allowed to say no. And that's okay and it doesn't mean that you then have to spend the rest of your day trying to catch them in the paddock or whatever. You can just walk away, come back later. And it was really, really interesting once I let that go a few times. Um, my mare in particular was really grumpy to catch and I would just go, all right, fine, I'll go see someone else and come back. And then she'd come straight to me yeah, and yeah. catch her, no problems. So it was really good, just that sort of immediate feedback from the horses that they're like, oh, you, this girl is listening to me now. Yeah. which already makes them happier. Like you don't even have to do anything. You just have to listen. Absolutely. Yes, definitely. Um, oh, I was going to say something else that you were talking about, but it's just escaped me. It'll come back. It'll come back later. But, yeah, so that was the, the sort of first portion of the program. Then we move into yeah. groundwork. Um, do you want to talk about how you found that in regards to connecting what you're doing on the ground and how that influenced things under saddle? Um, under saddle, look, probably with my more established mare, Maddie, who was going medium, it, it helped under saddle in terms of like different environments is where she was quite triggered. Um, she's a Sir Donahall and that, that's a real, a, a breeding line that is known to be quite environmentally sensitive. Um, but in terms of riding every day, that was actually her happy place. She loved work. Um, but I found that doing the exact same groundwork pattern at home, or not the exact same pattern, but waiting for the same mm -hmm. relaxation then helped when we went out that we just did the exact same thing. She would yawn, she would look and chew, and then I'd jump on, and that was just a lot easier than trying to get her to let go over the back on her straight away. Yep. Um, but with my big grey horse, he has always, so I broke him in when he was, two and a half, I think, because he was just going to be so big. He's 17 three. And he was always sort of the sixth horse in work and he was a bit naughty and I'd ride him for like 10 minutes and if he wasn't naughty, I'd get off. Um, so he's now 10-year-old and still he was really tricky to get on. Um, he was very cold back as a young horse. Like I used to jump on and he'd just capriole and off we'd go. Um, so he doesn't do that anymore, which is good, but he... I never really taught him to relax, to stand still. I would just launch myself on and he'd have a caprio and a bit of a buck and then he'd be fine. So I was like, oh, that's just what we do with the super mm. You just do that and you get on. Whereas definitely taking the time to make him more relaxed, not obedient, but actually reward the relaxation to get on, that has followed through into his work. Yeah, And that has followed through into the day after because he used to if he had a really good ride you couldn't catch him the next day because he's mm. like oh this hard work stuff isn't really for me because it was too much pressure for him although he physically felt like he could do it mentally he just didn't, didn't quite him. have the same yeah yeah so mm. it's really for him the food rewards particularly <clears throat> have been huge because he's an absolute foodie and as soon as I started rewarding him with food in the rhythm work my god did his mentality around riding change and when you think about it, it's like, well, why not? Like, why wouldn't yeah. you use that if that's what's going to motivate him? Whereas the mare is motivated by hard work. She loves it. Sometimes when you give her food, especially if she thinks she didn't do the right thing, necessarily she won't take it. But um, like she, she would take food, but she didn't 
enjoy it as much as him under saddle, whereas he's just like, oh, my God, this is the best thing ever. Yeah, that's cute. And how do you think, because I know that um, I've had a few conversations with people in my private messages and let's just say they compete and they're worried about the sort of judgment from other people in regards to letting your horse (coughs) graze while you're at a competition or like giving them a food reward or doing some of these other things. And I know that you, in conversation with you, you've always been pretty like go with the flow. Um, But what do you think about that? Do you think that there is some stigma attached to that? Or do you think that it's just like their own insecurities like projecting out because it's something different? Or what do you reckon? Yeah, to be honest, I think at the end of the day, no one really cares what other people do that much. Um, and it's all sort of internal stuff. Once I had um, a lady at Bonio say something, like, because I led Maddie down there because she's terrified of the reeds, or she was. She's actually really good now. Um, and she was like, oh, you're meant to ride them down here. I'm like, oh, yeah, it's just a bit safer to walk. Like, maybe someone else might take that a bit more personally, but I don't, just don't really care. Yeah. Um, but no, to be honest, I think the whole horse world is really changing. I do have... Um, lessons occasionally with a a level judge um just because i have another coach chris is brilliant we do a lot of protocol days together she's judged me a lot which is also good Mm -hmm. and she actually made a note the last time i had a lesson with her she's like i love what you're doing around the ring and in the ring because we're throwing the test she's like but this horse needs to throw the test because she's such a star once you have the relaxation in the ring you know, you're winning everything. Um, yeah. So that was really nice to actually, not that you need that external validation, no. but it was really nice for someone who's so experienced and horsey and sees so many mm. horses come through the ring to actually sort of take the time to say, I see what you're doing, I get it. And that's great because I think I've spoken to a few judges about it. Um, in the ring, I've always sort of said, I don't want to feel mm. um, like I'm being rude towards the judges so in terms of yeah. if something went wrong in the test or my horse felt tense I just circle and do it again and just cop the error of course so that the horse just learns that that's not how we travel yeah. in the ring mm. and every judge I've talked to really openly about it it's just like no nope, go for it and they're like just retire before the last hold and then you don't get a bad score like, that's a great idea yeah yeah um, so no I think at the end of the day most people want the sport to progress and to progress they need relaxation yeah. So, yeah. you know, relaxation to get those quality marks, which we don't get here in Australia as you do overseas. Mm-hmm. Um, so how do we train that? Like the horses just have to go in and, and do yeah. that and we have to be rewarded by judges who then don't say, you know, awful things which can happen, like mm-hmm. right of this, right of that, just ignore it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, I think that's really, really beautiful and just another reflection like because some people might not have had that experience, so it's nice to see both yeah. sides. Um, being expressed and yeah I really believe that if you're feeling like comfortable about what you're doing and you've got a really strong like why behind what you're doing um, and it it aligns with your values then it doesn't necessarily matter what people say because it's not in alignment with what you're doing and for the most part when people are so solid in their boundaries and what they're doing and why they're doing it nobody else cares it's only when you're kind of like oh I'm worried then you start to pick up on all of these extra things um, yeah. And just as a side note, one of the exercises that I asked my students to do the other week was just say, I want you to prepare an answer for what are you doing with your horse? And I want you to prepare an answer for if someone says why. And I want it to be like a sentence. And I need, it, I need you to really stand behind that because if you can't say, I'm working on building our relationship up and we're just focusing on groundwork at the moment. And then they say, why? And you can be like, because it's really important to me to form a solid connection with them. If you can't stand behind it, then of course you're going to be like floundering if someone says, hey, what are you doing? You know? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And I think it's great for people to like people to ask whether they are, you know, are looking to expand their knowledge further on the topic or not. It's a great chance for you to be like, well, this is why and this is what I'm finding. Yeah. And then people go, oh, do you know what? That sounds pretty cool, which is pretty much how, like, I've referred so many people onto CEP yeah. and that's just how it starts because they're I'm like, oh, well, this is what I did and this is how mm-hmm. I found it and this is sort of the skill set that I've learned. And then people are like, oh, that actually sounds really interesting. And they've come from a place where, you know, their horses are terrible, they're mad, they're wild, like, you know, quite negative language. And it actually shows that you really intrinsically don't want to talk about your horse that way or anybody that way. You know, yeah. you do want to find answers. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah, definitely. No, totally agree. 
All right. So that was the groundwork and how you were just able to kind of shimmy that in and just, um, I guess, the groundwork combined with the, like, understanding the horses and connecting with them on a deeper level is has made the leading better, which is going to make it safer for you to handle the horses on the ground and do all of those things, which is awesome. Um, Let's talk about the next portion of the program, which is all about um, desensitizing. And when I mentioned desensitizing, for those that aren't familiar with the work that I do, it's all about um, teaching our horses to respond to levels of pressure and doing it in a very systematic way where we're really honoring the horse's emotions. So we're not flooding them. We're not tipping them over threshold. We're really teaching them how to respond when they get a little bit worried. Um, And I remember this was one of the reasons that I was drawn to learn what I learn now because I was a competitor who was like, how do I prepare my horses for these different environments? And like you were saying before about the relaxation is so important when you're competing because essentially it's quite easy to train horses new things if they're feeling comfortable and they're not in pain right so it's like how can we really address those things before just trying to approach everything with the training aspect um and yeah i really feel like this is the missing piece in regards to the desensitizing that competitors are missing because you go from everything solid at home your horse is pretty comfortable maybe you take them out to a few lessons and then you go from like zero to 100 in terms of the environment and expect them to perform just as they did in these much less intense spaces and horses are flight animals they're designed to be on edge if they don't feel safe. So it's all about how can we cultivate that sense of safety in our horses at home first and really teach them to respond um, in a way that's going to benefit both of us so that they can feel more comfortable in these new places so it's not such a huge change. So can you just talk to us about your experience learning the desensitizing um, and how that had a flow on effect with the relationship with the horses and when you took them to competitions and floating and all of those things. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, the desensitization training was just um, huge for all of mine. I have four horses at the moment. They're all very, very different characters, which was really cool to see um, when introducing the tools. So I've got two mares and they're really sharp, really intelligent. One is not brave, one is way too brave. And then my two boys are both a bit chill and they're a little bit on the more shut down side which has actually made it they're the ones who have taken more time to get the response that I want out of them so they look like they're calm and relaxed about everything but they're still holding on to a little bit of tension whereas the girls picked it up so far so um introducing the oh it was the stream stick first for Maddie you know it took me two days I couldn't get it anywhere near her nose and that was really another good learning curve for me because I was like well the trick isn't to get it near her nose the trick is to make her relax um and then all of a sudden she understood it and then I went from like not being able to get anywhere near her nose to the next day being able to completely touch her all over and straight away head down licking chewing you know removed removed the stick um and then I'd pick it up and she just put her head down and the same with my big black mare who is yeah a really really big athletic um animal who's very brave but she picked it up so quickly that literally even now I won't have done any work with her with the stick or the flag for a little bit and I'll go and I'll pick it up and she'll just pop her head straight down so it really gave it just really gives the horses the answer to what you're looking for um and because they were all really light with the head down cues even if they didn't quite get the answer I could just help them and honestly with the mares you just think head down and they put their head down yeah um and then that really flowed through to, yeah, so going out to a competition, you know, something moving in the reeds or the bin or the puddle, whatever. We just stop, head down, wait for them to relax, back up, go again. Yeah. Um, so although it feels time-consuming in the moment, you know, it really does build into everything under saddle. So we had at one show, I had done a little bit of noise um, because Maddie was really scared of birds. So I'd done birds desensitising a lot and all throughout spring did not have a spook at a single mm. um, plover. It's the plovers that she's terrified of them. She'll hear them and just not go into that corner of the arena, which is fair. Um, but I did two sessions, I think, on plover sounds um, and same thing, just getting her to put her head down. And then as soon as she'd hear a plover, she wouldn't even, you could hear her, see her ear twitch, but she'd just carry on. 
Yeah. So that was awesome. And then one test, we had music come on in the middle of the test right behind her and she got a little bit tense. Um, and I was like, okay, that's fair. I haven't done any music. So went home, did some loud music sort of all around her and then the next four shows could not have cared less about yeah. music, whether it was on, off, coming on. Um, so it was just really, really cool to see that if you actually work towards it, it does improve. If yeah. you forget about it and don't don't touch base back on it again, you know, then you can't really accept yeah. that it's it's better. Yeah. So it was really how, good. Um, yeah. I was going to say, how empowering is that? Like how instead of going to a competition, your horse being worried about the sound behind them, instead of feeling like, oh, now I have to work her down more because yes. what if she spooks? Instead it's going, no, 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 I don't have to do that. All I have to do is get her comfortable with noises behind her. And that doesn't involve me just like blaring noise behind her um, and just making her cope with it. That There's a process that I can use to kind of dissect this, um, teach her how to feel comfortable around it, which is the same process I've taught her with all of these other different pressures. Yeah. And what I found with all of them, even the boys who weren't as fast, is that everything got faster, every new um, pressure, whether it was environmental or physical, every single response in the system was faster and the relaxation became faster and faster and faster the whole time. Yeah, um, definitely. So that was really cool. Yeah, because you are essentially like teaching them to go from stressed to relaxed, stressed mm. to relax, stressed to relax. And the more repetitions you do of that, the faster they're going to feel comfortable letting that go um, yeah. because they've got, they understand how to actually process what's coming up for them in their bodies um, and release it rather than just bottling it up. Um, exactly. So yeah, super, super cool. Um, and can you share a little bit more because I know that you had some really cool experiences with Maddie with like saddling um, and can you share your experiences with, yeah. uh, with the floating as well? Yeah, so Mads was just grumpy to saddle, um, I would say. So she'd just sort of make a face and, you know, make a bit of a mare face, um, but not do anything. And then the same with bridling. With bridling, she'd always try and, like, take a step off. And it was just the exact same thing every day. When I think about it, it was probably six years of just reinforcing that behaviour. So went back to just desensitising with the saddle blanket to the saddle and, like, it was just the approach and retreat. Um, and I think within two days of doing that she would just stand there perfectly so there'd still be um I know her cycle really well so it was still two you know two days within her cycle where she's a bit crampy um where she would make a bit of a face being tucked up um and early on on those days if she made that face I would just and then take the day and then once I did that I think for one month she never really made a significant like no face again um so I could tack her up her ears were forward the whole time which was so so nice, so nice. um <laughs> and she'd self-bridle I also taught her to self-holter which is so cute because um she's actually now in Queensland with, with her new rider who's doing CEP and um Kitty messaged me I think it was like the second day she got there she's like oh I caught Maddie today but I think I was taking too long because she's like shoved her head in the halter because she just she loves self-haltering herself now because she um gets a treat at the end and as soon as you flip the headpiece over her head she just starts like winning at you and it's like the cutest thing ever so she went from a horse who was quite grumpy to put the halter on mm. to actually adoring it like you've never seen such he heard such an excited like nicker it's just the cutest thing ever um yeah so so it was really cool to be able to sort of put that self-haltering and into the bridling as well mm. um and then, yeah, with Mac, he, he is a really big boy and he, uh, I think he hit his head when he was a young horse because he's just a bit of a goof. Um, and I always sort of just placated his not wanting to get on the float by taking somebody else with him. Like I don't think I've ever floated him anywhere by myself in case or by himself in case I couldn't get him back on. Um, and, yeah, so we took obviously took a huge step back and just got him comfortable being around the float um, because he would either charge on and then run back off or charge halfway on and then run back off or he goes halfway and then he looks around and doesn't look at the front and, you know, he sort of um, was very stressed about it, which was really upsetting because I didn't want him to be stressed about it. So this just gave us a really slow process in how to actually teach him how to park, which is something I'd obviously never done because I couldn't get on him either. So I taught him how to park really well and then I could manipulate that onto each stage of 
you know, park near the ramp, at the ramp, two feet on the ramp, four feet on the ramp, Mm. and also having that back cue really light. So it was one step back, two step backs, not flying backwards. Um, Yeah, so he's had some brilliant days. Like we've had days where he has, um, he's one who needs to do it quite consistently. The last two weeks I've actually been on bed rest, so I haven't been able to get out to practice any floating we had to go for a scope yesterday so he was fasted and he was in the box for you know 15 hours so that was a bit tricky to get him on which was fair because yeah you know that was just what it was going to be it was the worst sort of setup and we did have to go to the vet for this um scope but normally we have been able to sort of in if I've had anything coming up I've taken the week before and just practice not even putting him on the float just putting him near the float putting him halfway on the ramp and then he just walks on yeah which yeah. is really good so good yeah yeah no, that's awesome and what about your experience with your other mare that you were bringing into work how have you found the change in her so that's been great so she's also naturally a really um cold back to horse. she has like really her sort of her neurovascular bundle runs really close to the surface of her skin, like you can see it. Um, she's the only one I haven't broken in myself because I just thought she was way too much for me, um, and she was because the breaker didn't like her either. Um, so she she was always good for me when I got her home. She's had she was out. She's had a few huge injuries. Um, so this was bringing her back into work after yeah a year and a half out um, with a fractured C five. So this which obviously had neurological complications so this was a really nice time to be able to be slow to make sure that there still weren't any deficits which there are which is great Mm -hmm. um but it probably took us I'd say six weeks to just get really comfortable with the girth which when I reflect back she was never comfortable with the girth um so it was something that had been sort of again brushed over in her early training yeah and we've just jumped on and she's you know has been very, very tight in the back and very, she's never broke off. She's had a few broke with me, but nothing too, too crazy. Um, but she really is uncomfortable with, with the roller particularly. So now she just stands like an absolute doll 90% of the time to do up the roller. I can do it in a paddock. I can do it on the arena. I can do it at the stables. Um, and she's, you know, walk truck cantering both reins and into the long reins now, which is great. Um, really interesting. I have the girl, because uh, yeah, I'm not supposed to be doing much with the horses at the moment, so I have one of my students um, come and help me three times a week, and so she started long reining Mac, uh, the big boy, and that, yeah, he. Um, it was just really interesting watching someone else do it and that they're still not as confident with somebody else, but Belle particularly, like I had to make it, she was just lunging her. And I was like, oh, she looks really good today. I'll give her a hand to her and then you can as well because I didn't really have the understanding that when she would go into canter, that's when she'd bronk. And I'd, I'd always just send her forward, which was neither here nor there. She either stopped bronking or she didn't. Mm. Um, whereas after CEP, we just focus on, you know, she just has to think canter without bronking and then she gets to come back to the trot and then she does one stride and then she comes back to the trot. And she just picked that up so, so quickly. Mm. So it's very rare now that we get any sort of bucking at all um, on the lunge for me. And I gave her a canter and she cantered around beautifully and I handed her over to Tamika and she went to canter and she broke straight away. I was like, that's really interesting. Mm. Um, And it's purely because it was a different person. So we just worked on, you know, I sat in a chair and just sort of talked it through. I'm like, as soon as she thinks forward to canter, you let her drop and then we'll just go one stride and then, by the end, she got three strides. I was like, that's it, that's done. Yeah. Um, so it'll be really, really interesting to see how that progresses now. But yeah. I thought that was really interesting. I was like, hmm, that's yeah. just because it's a different pressure. It's someone else. She doesn't know her. She doesn't trust her. Yeah. And your energy. And, and your, they are. Yeah, your energy and intention plays a huge role. And it's just like I feel like, especially with those really expressive horses, they're always like, are you listening to me? Yes. And that is her 100%. And she's a proper alpha mare and if she doesn't feel like she's being listened to she gets on the front foot a bit um mm. as opposed to the well even maddie who is not an alpha mare at all she goes a bit internal the other boys go a bit internal where she gets on the front foot so she really <laughs> needs to feel like you're you're on you're in tune with her at all times yeah yeah awesome 
Um, and how have you found, because like you said before, you've referred quite a few of your students onto the Confident Equestrian Program, which is amazing. And I'm so grateful for that. Um, how have you found like coaching some of them since they started the program? Like, have you noticed anything like from a coach's perspective or I'm just curious? Um, yeah, definitely. Definitely a lot more empathetic and a lot um happier to break down into small goals and more about the why. It's yeah. more about the why. You know, why do you want to do this or need to do this? And I feel like we're now not working with, um, you know, as a coach you really often get people, not not my regulars, but people come to you for one lesson and they're like, oh, so the horse has been away for three weeks and so now I'm going to take them to yeah, this big yeah, show. Yeah. I'm like, well, no, you're not. Um, so less of that sort of stuff, more... Yeah. Um, more able to recognise and sort of understand the preparation that they need to put in mm-hmm. to, to then go out and put themselves and their horses in such a stressful environment. So not yeah. saying that you need to ride or do something with your horse all the time, but if you want to take them to that sort of yeah environment, you do need to put the work in. Yeah, um, you need to Whether they're them. a schoolmaster or not, you need to set them up because it's just not fair to them. Yeah, I completely agree. And I, yeah, yeah. Cool. I have, um, it's been interesting though because I actually did teach at a adult riders rally, and I made a girl get off, which I've never really done before. I've certainly made like I'm I'm a real Nazi. I don't let people jump things that I don't think that they should be jumping, um, which is why I don't have anyone fall off like ever. But uh, and it, it is really hard when you don't know people or don't know how they'll take it. Um, but it was a girl who had a really new horse. They hadn't been together long, and I just had such a bad feeling in my gut about it. And anyway, we got off, we did some groundwork, got back on. It went okay. Like I just didn't feel like something was going to happen. And she actually now comes to me for lessons, which is great because I was like, oh, that could have gone one of two ways, which is fine. I don't yeah. care. But I just did not want someone to get hurt that day. No. Um, so it's really cool just seeing other people who don't know me. Like I've been teaching for a long time and I have a really great small group of clients that I stick yeah. with. Um so it's really great seeing people come from outside of that sort of circle and really want to learn a different way. Yeah. Yeah, that's beautiful. Um, and how have you found the process? Because like you briefly mentioned in this podcast earlier, um, one of the mares that you're working with in the Confident Equestrian Program, Maddie, you've since sold her, <clears throat> excuse me, sorry. <clears throat> there we go. Um, you've since sold her on to a new home. Um, and I thought it was really, really beautiful because you reached out to me before this happened and said, hey, I would really like for the new owner to be involved in the Confident Equestrian Program because I really want Maddie to have like the best possible um, experience in a new home because you've got such a beautiful bond with her and you've done all this work and you like you want her to be happy. Um, so now her new owners um, are part of the current group of the Confident Equestrian Program. But how have you found that experience and what was your like? I know you mentioned to me the other day that your mum was like, "Why are you doing that?" Like, <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. It's just like it's just been so seamless for the horse. Um, which is, I think, the only thing that I, I care about, to be honest. Um, yeah, so I needed to downsize because, like I said, I've got four and I'm, I'm six months pregnant, so I definitely can't ride that many, that many soon. Um, and I actually only advertised Maddie because I assumed I would not find the right person for her because I am very picky. Um, and I only did it to sort of placate my husband and my dad to get one off the property and then... Yeah, I had um, this beautiful lady from Queensland and it all worked out. She was meant to be going to Perth and I didn't really want her to go to Perth. And then that person pulled out the last minute, which was frustrating, but it was a perfect sliding doors moment because I called um, Kitty straight away who was coming down from Queensland the next day. So she came straight out and rode Mads and it was just beautiful. Like just, she just adored her, um, which was so nice. Like you never... I don't sell many horses. My last horse that I sold was actually one of my four-star guys and he went to the agent who was selling him because she was like, I want Bassie. Um, But I had all these kids come out who had very wealthy parents and like no one even bought him a carrot and that just breaks yeah. my heart. So to have someone just absolutely um, glowing over my horse was so lovely. Um, yeah, so, so uh, Kitty ended up buying her, which was great. We had to wait a little bit to get her up to Queensland. Um, because of the floods so I was really stressed about 
the trip up because it actually ended up taking a week. Their track broke down. It was such a such a nightmare. But I knew in my heart that when she got there, she'd be fine because Kitty was just so on board with CEP. She looked you up straight away. She's like, "Nope, it sounds great." Um, yeah, so I actually took took that out of the price. Um, I was like, "If you you know want buddy, that's great. I would like you to do this course. You don't have to. Obviously, I wasn't forcing her to, but I was like, but that's what I'm offering." Um, and as you said, yes, Stephen, he was like, that's a really great way to just know that whoever you're selling your horse to is a good person. Um, yeah. If they're happy to sort of, you know, expand on their skill set, really. Because mm. um, that's that's what it is. Unless you have done this course before, it's just about expanding on your skill set and being open to sort of personal growth. Yeah. And I just thought, particularly for Mads, you know, the rhythm work was all there if she could build a bond um with her new owner that would like she'll die for you then like, she's a proper mare she will do anything for you and yeah. she loves her so much I'm a little bit sad how much she loves her already in like four weeks oh. <laughs> but you <laughs> but did all, really, you really made all that foundation yeah and it's just it's so beautiful to see and she updates me all the time and they went out and did their first clinic and she did her groundwork before she jumped on and she's like she just mirrored me everywhere it was off the lightest touch and it's just like that's perfect because you know, she's gone out and done that with me, so now she's doing that with you. Um, so she knows it's exactly the same. Um, yeah. And they just that's it. They just want to be listened to. So when they know that you're going to behave similarly or, you know, yeah. respond to the same cues that they're giving, then it doesn't matter who's handling them. They'll start to trust everybody. Absolutely. And I think, like, because she's going through the Confident Equestrian Program, she's learning the same sets of cues that you essentially mm-hmm. learn in the same way of, like, viewing her behavior um, and that just makes it so much less confusing for the horses because imagine if even if you're doing similar things but if you have a completely different set of cues or a different way of viewing things that's going to feel so different for your horse it's like you're speaking a different language to them whereas like they're making such amazing progress because everything is flowing together so seamlessly Um, and I just think it's yeah such a beautiful thing and yeah it's just it's so cool to see it all unfold I'm like how beautiful for Maddie like how nice yes, exactly and at the end of the day that's all that matters you just want the horse to be yeah happy because if they're happy and safe then the own like the rider will be like I'm just I'm so big on matching the right yes people and horses and it just it needs to be safe and it needs to be enjoyable yeah. um you know most people do this for pleasure and even if you do it for a business at some point you did it just because you loved the horse yeah so, that's yeah. what it's going to be about. Absolutely. Um, and what would you say to any sort of, let's just anyone considering joining the program, but come at it from like a competitor lens. Like what would you say to someone that's like, oh. yeah. yeah, absolutely. So I think coming at it from, um, cause obviously the branding is confident equestrian program. So sort of, and the market is, or has been more tipped towards, you know, people who are nervous yeah. or, lacking sort of confident with their horses which wasn't me um yeah. so I think it's just don't like look past that because it's so much more than that and it's really just about building a skill set to show horses how to give you the right answer in yeah. every situation yeah. um and how to achieve true relaxation and yeah. to reward for that um and that positive reinforcement is not a bad thing yes like it's, it's just something that we had not really I really hadn't used before. I mean, I used it to bribe them to love me, but not to actually reward them for anything. Mm. Um, And, yeah, just seeing the difference in particularly those less motivated horses come alive when food. Mm. Wouldn't you use that to get the best out of them? Yeah. Because it makes it fun for them, just about making it fun. And I think that's really Mm. where the program sort of falls. It's just about making things relaxed easy and fun and really streamlined for you and for the horse and you can just put that straight into um yeah any horse whether it's pleasure or competition yeah absolutely and what advice would you give to your younger self um to be honest it's really funny because I was thinking about saying to my husband the other day what we used to do as kids like the stuff that we do that we would not do now but it did make really quiet happy horses um so probably uh, honestly to do more work like this early on um and to continue on with it instead of sort of leaving it behind and prioritizing riding um and 
and just to make sure that each day isn't training it's fun for you and the horse yeah and that you don't have to do something every day like yeah. you can do five minutes I now you know take my bridle up on the quad bike and bridle the filly in the paddock because I don't have time to get her out but yeah. I'm still doing something um so that short training sessions are beneficial and it does not have to be on the horse yeah amazing um and what is your equestrian perspective or a message that you'd like to share um a message is really probably that we are just so lucky to get to work with horses um they are so forgiving of us more than we think and I think the ones who probably display you know the behavior that we don't want have actually been the most forgiving at some point in their lives and now they're just reacting because it's a survival instinct and it's actually up to us to Mm. know that notice it and fix it or work towards making it better it's not up to the horse to do it for us yeah Yeah, Yeah. absolutely we've got to help them yeah all right well thank you so much for joining me today I really appreciate hearing your insights and just offering that different perspective coming from someone who um, is a competitor and like you said you have always like been pretty confident with the horses it was just expanding on your skill set which really led you to have these sort of um, deeper level insights and it just makes all of the training that you are trying to achieve with the horses so much easier because you understand how to just break it all down um, whether it's a component in your like actual dressage work or whether it's an environmental component you know how to work the work towards getting the horses comfortable with those things yeah yeah cool yeah all right well i will talk to you later brilliant thanks felicity bye Well, I hope you enjoyed listening to this episode of the Equestrian Perspective podcast. If you really enjoy it, please hit subscribe on the podcast so you can stay up to date with every episode that gets released. And also, if you want to share it around, please do so. Tag me on social media at Felicity Davies with an underscore at the end. And if you have any recommendations for episodes or guests that you would like me to interview on the podcast, please let me know via social media or if you have any questions at all, I'm happy to chat and I'm here for you whenever you need. So thank you for listening and I will see you in the next episode. Bye.